Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Larry Bailey, Michelle Sergio, and Miss Music Teacher. Coming up on DTNS, IKEA forges ahead with augmented reality, Shopify has a good use for NFTs, and the Brave search engine gives you back control. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 22nd, 2022. So many twos. Deuce is wild in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Mary. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I would like to start with a few tech things you should know. Good idea, Tom. Amazon announced its first fully autonomous mobile robot called Proteus, designed to move large carts in warehouses. Proteus bots are equipped with advanced safety, perception, and navigation technology, so says the company, to avoid human warehouse workers. Amazon also showed off a robot arm system called Cardinal that can select and lift individual packages up to 50 pounds expected to deploy in warehouses next year. Amazon told Forbes, replacing people with machines is just a fallacy and that it expects the robots will improve safety as well. I feel like now I don't believe them. I would have been fine until they said it was a fallacy. But Doth protest too much. Yeah. Fitbit launched a new sleep profile. If you're one of the people who pays $10 a month for premium, uh, it'll examine 10 metrics like time before sound sleep, disrupted sleep, bedtime consistency. The feature will offer you monthly reports comparing those metrics with averages for your age and gender. Sleep profiles will be available to premium users on the Fitbit Sense, the Versa 3, the Versa 2, the Charge 5, Lux, and Inspire 2 wearables. First report is expected as soon as July 4th. Microsoft will soon add keyboard and mouse support to Xbox Cloud Gaming. The company says developers who don't already support keyboards and mice can add it now, so titles will be ready when the feature launches. Well, that's good for PC gamers. Uh, Back in 2019, Google released Android Auto for phone screens, but then discontinued the feature last year, 2021, if you were running Android 12 or higher. Uh, However, those Android 11 and earlier folks, now you're on the chopping block. Google has ended support for Android Auto for phone screens on all versions of Android. Uh, If you try to uh, launch it, it'll say Android Auto is now only available for car screens. However, if your car doesn't have a screen, you can use Google Assistant driving mode instead. It's a different thing. Oh, Google. Google with your naming. Uh, You just never (laughs) fail to to impress. (laughs) Nothing. The company, nothing, confirmed to PC Mag it will not launch its phone in North America, instead focusing on the UK and parts of Europe where the company has strong partnerships with carriers. Meanwhile, if you get a nothing phone and you try to use it on a US carrier, you'll get an unpredictable coverage on T-Mobile. You won't have any voice over 4G on AT&T and you won't have service at all on Verizon. The company says it does have plans to launch a smartphone in the US in the future. So North America gets nothing. Wait, no. Yep. North America. <laughs> well, it, yes and no. Doesn't Tom. get nothing. Yeah. Wait. Right. I don't know why that took me it's off not, guard. Not I should have known. I should have known you had a joke like that coming and it caught me off guard and made North me America well is done. not for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's talk about IKEA. IKEA launched a feature called Creative. And of course, because it's IKEA, it's spelled with a K and a V at the end. Uh, it's available for the IKEA website and iPhones and lets you design your living area with digital furniture. And in fact, iPhones with LiDAR sensors will be able to include even more spatial detail. Okay, so for anybody who's like, well, hold on a second. IKEA already does this, right? Isn't mm-hmm. it called IKEA Place? That's an app that lets you put a digital version of IKEA furniture for sale in your room. How, how is this different? Yeah, so Place isn't going away. You'll still be able to use Place, but everybody does that now. Amazon, Wayfair, they all do that. Creative does a 3D scan of your room and then uses computer vision and machine learning from geological labs to let you remove some or all of your furniture. That's the twist. 
You don't have to put it in the room with the furniture in it. You can get rid of your furniture and then add IKEA items to see how they'll look. Uh, you can also use the app for more than 50 pre-made showrooms if you don't want to use your own space. TechCrunch's Lauren Forrestal tested it on an iPhone with LiDAR. Uh, you stand and point the camera at five target spots in the room. The app will direct you where. And you have to do it just right. It's like learning to golf. You got to keep your elbows in. You pivot with the wrists. Uh, and then once you've done that, you wave the phone in a figure eight motion to help the algorithm stitch together those five images that you took. Uh, then you'll have to step to the left or right and repeat the whole thing a second time. The scan takes about two minutes and it's another five minutes to upload it and make it available to use. Uh, that's if you're using a LiDAR iPhone. If you're using the website or a phone without LiDAR, you'll need to take five photos They'll direct you on that and then upload those and they get stitched together. But like you would expect, it doesn't have as much detail. Either way, once you're done, you can then place items that will be accurate by size. You can put things like lights up on the wall and you can save your items to your account or put them right in a shopping cart, of course. Uh, you can also share your finished design with other people, including an IKEA interior designer if you want. So for anybody who's like, all right, this sounds pretty good. Uh, IKEA has had this in the works for a while. Creative has been in testing since April of last year, so just over a year, and hopes to eventually add options to change things like wall colorings uh, and other features. You know, just, just kind of make it your own. Creative will launch on the web and iOS in the U.S. coming later this summer to Android and other markets in September. So I am in the mood for this. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> yeah, we're okay. we're looking at our basement and we're trying to make some decisions about what we want to do. And it's really hard to visualize. I have a, I really struggle with that. And people say, Scott, you you draw and paint and you, you can't visualize. I really can't. When it comes to 3D spaces, actual living spaces, I can't picture it any mm -hmm. other way than it mm -hmm. is currently in. So these tools are really helpful for people like me who want to, you know, maybe make a change down there. And this sounds like maybe the most comprehensive I'd heard of. Uh, what's funny is this made me ask, start asking questions that made me have a little naivete, or as I would say, Ikea tay. Uh, that's <laughs> terrible. Forget it. Scratch from the record. Naive anyway. Ikea tay. <laughs> no, you said Na that. Naive Ikea tay. There you go. That's even better. Um, <laughs> but, but it's spelled I, with an I, umlaut somewhere. I never, I never <laughs> know what Ikea is up to. I don't know if it's because I don't go into the store very often. I do have Ikea furniture. We pick up stuff here and there, but I, I didn't know they were in the home, like, uh, internet of things market i didn't know they had products as back as far back as 2014 in that regard i didn't know they had the first smart bulb like a lot of these things i don't think they're good at telling us about so i'm glad we're hearing about this one and this is seems like maybe the most mainstream push they've done in terms of different outlets picking it up this show is one of them but i feel like ikea is bad at telling me they have cool tech to work with on home stuff you got to well, go to an Ikea it, store more often. That's all there is. It, I guess so. Yeah, or yeah. Ikea.com or, yeah. you know, whatever. You know, th what this reminded me of is more and more, just for fun, even though I, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily moving apartments anytime soon, hopefully never <laughs> again. But, uh, but when I do look at apartments, you see that, like, the, you know, you can tell that it's slightly fake staging. But it gives you a sense of like, oh, that's what a couch and, you know, a TV and a couple chairs and a coffee table would look like in that space. I feel like this is just like one step closer to that uh, virtual staging thing that Ikea can help with. Yeah. Right. If you if you if, you know, if you if you're a landlord. Right. And you've got some tenants in there and you take a bunch of pictures of the house, but you're like, yeah, well, but that's not going to make the next person want to live here so much because they want their own thing. To have this much control over uh, how you can present it and how you can stage it, I think that's probably what Ikea is going for here. Yeah, I feel I feel like you're right, Scott, that people don't realize how maybe not ahead of the game, but on the edge of the game, Ikea is. Like you said, they, they had their first hub for a smart home back in 2014. Just yesterday, we mentioned that they are part of the standards organization for the metaverse. Uh, and then we get this AR announcement today. So it makes sense like, oh, I, that's what they're doing. They want to be able to let you go into a metaverse and design your home and maybe buy virtual Ikea items in a metaverse someday or something like that. But I I I think... 
they are well placed for all of those things in a way that a lot of other retailers are. And I don't think it's paid off quite yet because the smart home hasn't quite permeated everywhere. But matter is about to make it do that, I think. And augmented reality, as we heard, is kind of wonky. Like, it's just as easy to assemble Ikea furniture as it is to remember all the steps of like, okay, keep your <laughs> arms in and then pivot this way. And like, eventually though, this same technology will be available in some kind of AR headset from somebody and we'll do real time scanning. So all you'll have to do is look around the room and you won't have to follow these crazy steps. But Ikea is getting in and getting this tested ahead of time. Yeah, and they're in a good position to have the vested interests that make sense. Like, uh, you know, Amazon has products like this for me, but... I don't know. Do I think of Amazon as somebody's going to help me figure my house out? Not really. Well, and theirs is like, more like places anyway, where it's like, yeah. oh, you want to see this piece of furniture over there? Great. Put it over there. But I've tried that and been like, yeah, but without moving my furniture around, it doesn't really help. This lets yeah. me virtually move my furniture around, to, to Sarah's point, do virtual staging and stuff. Yeah. And especially in the case of, of me, if I do anything in the studio and change anything down here, it will probably be with Ikea furniture. Like I was going to go there anyway. I like the pricing. I like the simplicity, um, you know, quality is an arguable thing, but uh, being able to have more tools to do that, it really is in their interest to give us these tools. I just think they should be a little bit better about communicating it. And maybe they are now and, and maybe they just kind of been <laughs> doing just fine. I don't go to Ikea enough. Clearly, the meatballs don't pull me in like I, they used to. I love how, Scott, you're like, I love all of this, but I just wish Ikea was more you relentless me? about yeah, telling me. Just tell me about it, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I guess everybody's vying for my eyeballs these days and Ikea is just not. Yeah, getting. I was going to say. And I don't I think, think of them that way. I, I just think, think Ikea's of them as, premise is you'll come to them for home stuff. And then they'll show you what they have. Not yeah, probably. You'll, you'll, you'll think, well, I should go to Ikea for their smart home stuff, right? It'll yeah. be more of like, you're going to go there anyway, maybe just to get meatballs. And then you'll find out that they have all this stuff. I do like going for meatballs. And I also wish they would, you know, those fake flat TVs they have in their little fake living rooms. I want mm -hmm. them to sell me a, f a fake flat TV. It can't be that much money. I feel I like you could just like this. take one. <laughs> you think I should just steal one? I don't think we should I mean, be advocating I'm not that. So, uh, I'm not yeah. condoning, you know, theft, but I'm like, I don't think anyone's going to be like, oh, fake TV. We yeah, really look at me walking that. out of there with a with I a bet TV. you'd get They'll a fake either. TV on Amazon right now or Alibaba even. Probably. And For I don't sure. Know like, I can't buy them from somewhere. Yeah. Somebody's I, don't, making them. I don't know why I'm fascinated by those things, but I love them. So, so you know, not to, not to take us too far from the topic, make those available for purchase. That's all. <laughs> No I, to bring us back to my own topic, while I say Ikea just wants you to come into the store and then expose you to stuff, very obviously creative is not that. Creative is we want you to see how the furniture will look so that you'll then order it. Um, yeah. So it, it's trying to hit you at home, trying to hit you where you live, literally. It literally hit me where I live. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, Shopify will hit you where you live when they do stuff with Twitter. Shopify announced <laughs> around 100 new features this week as part of its semi-annual Shopify Editions Showcase. One of the main announcements was that Twitter partnered with Shopify to launch a sales channel app for all U.S. merchants, letting merchants on board to Twitter's shopping manager dashboard. This provides product catalog tools and lets merchants add other shopping features to profiles and so forth. Twitter also recently launched the new shopping-related feature. Uh, this included includes a new product drops feature. Twitter pre previously launched mobile storefronts and live stream shopping. Shopify says orders placed through the partner integrations with Twitter and others quadrupled in the first quarter of 2022. So they're pushing that direction. TechCrunch's sources say Twitter began testing a notes feature with uh, selected users, letting users create articles with rich formatting and uploaded media. Twitter will hold a Chirp developer conference on November 16th in San Francisco. It's only uh, held one other Chirp conference, by the way, and that was back in 2010. Dang, I barely remember that. Yeah. I, I uh, completely forgot about it until we talked about it today. Which is like, oh, which is yeah, funny, right. you know, a, a company the size of Twitter, not that you have to have events every year, but uh, the fact that, you know, Chirp was was back in 2010 and and I don't know people have uh have <laughs> have been working on on products rather than talking about products at events uh since then is quite some time. Yeah. I I like this whole Shopify thing. Uh I I when I think about certain brands that I follow on Twitter and there aren't that many, but some some of them, 
you know, like Nike, for example, like I follow Nike on sure. Twitter. So that's a very obvious example. It's like, okay, well, Nike's got their own thing. But usually if there's some new cool sneaker or the company is pushing, you know, a, a collab with an artist or whatever, then you you get that and you might get a you might get a uh, an image and then you get a link and then it bumps you out to wherever that you you know end up finishing the transaction that's the mm -hmm. eventual goal for the company sure. so for this to be something that's a little bit more integrated mm -hmm. in twitter and i've talked ad nauseum about the fact that i use a third party twitter app so a lot of this stuff probably wouldn't even show up for me unless i was using web twitter um, or you know an official twitter app but i think that this is this is potentially a pretty untapped market for Twitter just because so many folks and brands are on Twitter. But but uh, the, the idea is that you're you're just kind of letting people know where to go elsewhere to do the thing that you want to do. And so making, to do the thing that easy, you want to do. Right. Because yeah. you can already right. link out to your Shopify account on Twitter, right? So this this sure. has to be more compelling than that. It has to make it easy. To, for the shopper to be like, oh, I'm, I'm not really leaving Twitter and I'm able to buy this stuff. But the key is that you are still checking out on the Shopify website. So mm -hmm. even though you never feel like you're leaving Twitter, Shopify is handling the whole customer relationship, which means the merchant is handling the whole customer relationship, which is super smart for Twitter because they're stealing a page out of Instagram's book where they're like, hey, folks, sell stuff on our platform. We've got a captive audience. They love being here. Sell them some stuff. But unlike Facebook, Meta, Instagram, they're not taking a cut because they know they'll make their money off of merchants wanting to promote a tweet to make more sales they don't need to take a take a cut of that uh and and maybe they will maybe they won't but to get it started it's going to be much more compelling to be like yeah just just integrate your shopify store with us you don't have to pay anything extra and you get more sales you know you want to promote a tweet great we'll talk otherwise you know yeah. have at it I have a, I've had the experience on Instagram before, and I, I thought I'd never be the person to do this because I just thought I don't know I thought I was too high and mighty for this. But using Instagram, you get an advertisement for something that may interest you, and you click on it, and literally a buy is a click away. Yep. it's not hard. It's just boom, get it. And that's what made the decision for me to say I will spend ten dollars right now on these replacement nibs for the for my stylus pen. Yeah, uh, from this company who obviously, you know, through data collection knows who I am and what I need. And so I did that and it was so easy and so fast, almost a little too easy and too fast. It kind of was like, who did I actually buy this through? What, what was the deal here? Like, there's a little bit of that feeling if you're not used to it. But I think Twitter would benefit by having something like that. What the third parties will do with their apps, like TweetBot and Twitterific and all these, I don't know. Maybe they'll integrate too. But, uh, you know, if you're using the official app and you're looking for quick ways to grab stuff without having to do too many clicks, too much jumping around, this seems like a cool idea. Uh, Shopify also announced something called token gated commerce that will let customers link crypto wallets to a Shopify store for the purposes of using NFTs. Shopify already has let merchants sell NFTs if they want, but token gating lets a merchant use an NFT like a loyalty card. Uh, so you can reward fans and VIPs mm. with exclusive access to products, perks, or even experiences. They did a test run at South by Southwest with a company where if you had the NFT from that company, you could show up and get access to exclusive products and an exclusive experience in real life. Uh, so this includes in-person shopping, not just online. And Pretty I think, cool. Yeah. Oh, I, go ahead. I, I well, no, I was just going to say, I, I think that's... This is a more compelling use of NFT technology that doesn't care if NFTs yep. are tanking or if cryptocurrency is tanking. It's like, no, we're just mm -hmm. using the technology to help you have a better relationship with your customer. Yeah, it's there whether your things are up or things are down. I do like that about it. Because I mean, I the loyalty card thing is, I mean, we, we've been doing this for some time. So yeah. this is it's sort of the modern version of that. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. adhesive it wombat is, is like, though. oh, we're just what we wanted, more NFTs. You're talking, I think, about the NFTs that can be fraudulent or you don't understand why they cost so much. That's not what this is. This is just using the technology of the NFT to be to be able to prove who you are easily uh, in, in a better way than we have with current loyalty cards. Yeah. And like uh, like you pointed out in the beginning, and I totally agree with the, the building the technology or the conduits for the stuff to be manageable, regardless of where the market is or where everyone thinks it is, or where we're speculating at any time, is not a bad thing at all. Because some form of the technology and the tech, whether it's NFTs or not, are going to be here. And the more 
pipeline we have to handle this stuff, the more, I don't know, structured and grounded it'll be. I, I think this is always good when this happens. So. Yeah. Uh, but if you have a thought about it, we'd love to hear it. Email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. The Brave browser folks launched a search engine back in October of last year. One piece of news is that Brave Search is out of beta. Woo woo. Another piece of news is that Brave Search is launching a new feature that is in beta called Goggles. Not like Google Goggles. This is different. Uh, Brave's Goggles let you modify the criteria for your search ranking. So you can adjust things like whether a query should rely more on blogs or maybe more on mainstream news sites. Brave isn't opening up its search algorithms, so it's not totally open, but it does give users more control than a lot of other search engines do. To try the feature, you search for something, then you choose the goggles button, and then Brave will supply goggles from developers that you can choose to follow or not. But, uh, Tom, I know you've kind of looked into this. This is this is a little bit more than switching a few settings, right? Y yes and no. Um, it's both easier and harder than you think, depending on, on what you want to do with it. The goggles themselves are just unencrypted text files with instructions for re-ranking. Uh, and if you want to create your own, you can, but you need to learn the syntax and host them on GitHub or GitLab. Uh, so there's a little bit of a learning curve. Most people will likely just be using filters made by others. For example, All Sides, uh, which ranks political leanings in news publications, has made two filters, one for left sources, one for right sources. Uh, other pre-made filters that are there right now at launch include one that attempts to remove copycats, uh, one that removes the top thousand most viewed websites, so you can see lesser seen sources. One that narrows results to a list of tech blogs, uh, if you want to get just tech stuff. And one that removes any result from Pinterest. Uh, the other two are even more specific. <laughs> one removes the top thousand most viewed websites, but then prioritizes the most popular domains on Hacker News. And then another one boosts content related to the Rust programming language. Uh, you can turn goggles on and off if you want to compare your tweaked results to what the search engine normally returns. And Brave is fine if other search engines wanted to use this, right, Sarah? Yeah. Uh, apparently, when Brave published a paper about the idea for goggles back in October of last year, it offered to share the tech with other search engines, other privacy-focused uh, search engines that could benefit uh, include DuckDuckGo which uses Bing results, StartPage, which uses Google results, and Mojik. However, no company has taken Brave up on their offer as of yet. Yeah, and I don't know why that is, except that <clears throat> maybe they're, you know, it's more of an offer in spirit. It feels, than, than an it, offer it feels in, a little you know, bit, <laughs> if I don't know, if I, if I were over at uh, uh, DuckDuckGo, I might be like, Let's just see. You yeah, know, let's see if it how works. the development community, you know, also, takes to this. There's a if difference they do. between like go ahead and use it and let me help you implement it, right? Those are mm -hmm. those are two entirely different things. Yeah, True. that's a whole different bag of cheese. Like, I, look, these two two of the companies mentioned here, Brave in particular and DuckDuckGo, are kind of my go tos these days. One for browser, one actually, I really like the DuckDuckGo browser. I hope it comes out of beta soon. But the uh, I use their search engine, and um, what's 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 interesting here to me is it reminds me of a whole different kind of filtering. And I, and I think that's why I'm drawn to this. Um, this is going to sound a little bit weird, but the comparison I would use is a video game I play or have played before called Grim Dawn. It's a action RPG, think Diablo three, but you know, sort of a different take on it. And in that game, it has loot filtering. So if you're sick of just dealing with all the, the, the common and the, and the somewhat mm -hmm. rare items mm -hmm. that drop that you don't need anymore because you're all maxed out. You just want to see legendaries. It and just won't show drops. you the, the common stuff. You can you fill it, filter it out. So they literally don't clutter up your screen and drop on the ground for you to pick up. They virtually don't exist to you. And that's really compelling. But then you start talking about information and who gets what and how they get it. And then also how that information's monetized. I get why people might be a little squeamish on this. I, I like, like that it. this is uh, I like that this is developer oriented versus having to go in and set filters because nobody would use it. You need to make it easy to use for most people. So providing a bunch of filters that are easy to understand. Oh, this is going to remove the top thousand websites. Great. Oh, this is just going to give me tech blogs. Awesome. Uh, I I also like that it is 
developer friendly, which is like, hey, if you want to do the learning curve, you can do this yourself because I think enough people will be willing to try this to do it. And that way I could take a stab at saying, you know what, I just need to get rid of the day's news sometimes because I'm researching a story about the day's news like happened with Apple Passkey and I need to find out what Apple did before Passkey and I can't because Google is just showing me the news, right? And so it'd be nice to have a filter that easily does that. I know, I know there's other ways to do that in Google, but they're they're cumbersome. It'd be nice to just click on one button in Brave Search and be yeah, filter that. Uh, so I think this is great. The problem is, are enough people using Brave Search to create a community around this stuff, which is what yeah. you need for this to thrive? Well, and what you had described earlier, Tom, is like, okay, there's some somewhat specific filters <laughs> from obviously companies being like, let's see what kind of results we get from this if somebody were to use it. And that's great. That that makes a lot of sense. I think there are a lot of branding opportunities here. But uh, but yeah, how how much does you know, as a, as somebody who devours a lot of news, you know, every morning I'm like, this makes perfect sense to me. I could maybe use Brave to search for DTNS rather mm -hmm. than just kind of search for what I'm doing if I'm just casually surfing the net type of thing. Kind of two two different uh, situations. But how many how many people are out there that want that? Maybe a lot. Maybe more than I think. Maybe, yeah. but maybe less. I mean the. Part of the problem is I think that the we're, we all say we want as many options as possible. We all want choice. We want to be able to flick things on and off and use things the way we want to use them. But I feel like that's a little bit at odds with the free internet finding ways to make money on the periphery. And I I just don't know. I also don't think people want as much choice as they think they want. Mm. I think they like to feel like they do. But at the end of the day, some of them just want to hit the search and get the result they want and move on. And if they have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get specific results or only categorize results or whatever. Bother. I'm not that, really is, will. that is why uh, I like their implementation. It's a lot of hoops to create a filter, but if there's a filter you like that's been created, it's really easy. You just click yeah. it and it'll, and like then you that. unclick it. If you're like, oh, I want to see the, the other results. It's just a matter of like, are the filters you want going to be created by someone? Um, or are you going to be willing to put in the time to create your own? And I don't know, brave girls, are you ready? Let's <laughs> <laughs> let's nice. do this yeah uh yeah i i i i love this idea i'm more skeptical whether it's actually going to catch on but we'll see yeah all right let's check out the mailbag we got a good one from thor thor says hello from sunny and delightful oslo norway hello thor uh thor had a couple quick thoughts on our 6g chat that we had with shannon morse yesterday he says you mentioned that the lower power draw makes it seem more environmentally friendly just wanted to add that it does depend on how many transceivers are needed for a given area. Since the frequency is even higher, the range would probably be even lower due to higher attenuation. The total mm. power per area would be a function of power draw per unit and the area that it serves. Also, the impact of the production of the transceiver units. Although that's a one-time cost for the lifetime of the unit, it does also add to the environmental impact per area served. Yeah. So there's some math to do to see if this will really be a power save in the implementation or not. Mm -hmm. It's a good point, mm -hmm. Thor. Thank, yeah. Thanks for very kindly making this point. We appreciate it. Is he even <laughs> allowed to send emails on a day that isn't Thursday, though? That seems like a, a, he's, he's Thor. He's named send after Thursday. He wants, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> oh, gosh, you guys. Uh, Thor, <laughs> Thor has emailed us in the past, and Thor, please keep doing so. Uh, we appreciate <laughs> your feedback, and we appreciate all of your feedback, by the way. Feedback at dailytechnewshow.com is where to send an email. If, you know, something piques your interest, something that we talk about on the show, you say, ah, you know, I've got a little something to add here, or I have some thoughts, or I might even have, uh, you know, some dissent. We want to hear it. Uh, please do email us early and often. Thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. As always, what's been going on in your world? Well, plenty. Uh, if you're interested in the cod the podcast that I do, and there are a ton of them, award-winning podcasts. It's actually true, but I don't like usually saying that. Uh, <laughs> you can find them. And uh, especially if you're a gamer or if you're just looking for some daily entertainment, all of it can be found at frogpants.com. That includes podcasts, of course, the artwork I do, comic strips, a bunch of other stuff. So point your, uh, uh, all your browsers, all your brave and otherwise browsers right there, frogpants.com. And if you're trying to capture, capture me on, uh, on the Twitter, you can find me at Scott Johnson. Special thanks to Chad Gertz. Chad, you're one of our lo top lifetime supporters for DTNS, and we want to thank you for all the years of support. 
Chad for a press. Chad yeah, for a press. Chad. I mean, we mentioned it yesterday that if you become a new patron, your name goes here. We should also add that if you become a new patron, you get all kinds of other things too, like regular merchandise that's exclusive to patrons. You get a longer version bonus of the episodes. show. You get a bonus episode at certain tiers. Uh, I have a feeling after this this part wraps on the free version, we're going to be talking more about bubbles as far as the Brave Brow, I want to talk about that as regarding Brave Search. So you get a lot if you become a patron. I'm just saying. Indeed. And just uh, as far as patrons go, there's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. If you're a patron, you already know. But if you'd like to know more about it, patreon.com slash DTNS is where to go. Just a reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>